Welcome to the St. Joseph Radio Presents live program broadcasting to you from the Rome of the West, St. Louis, Missouri. The program that for over 30 years has brought you eloquent speakers from across the globe to help explain, clarify, and evangelize the Catholic faith. Our program covers a variety of topics relating to current issues and occurrences in our daily lives. Now, with the aid of technology, we are able to bring the gospel message to the four corners of the world where Christ himself did say, those who have ears ought to hear. It is our hope at St. Joseph Radio that through these programs, we can help evangelize the world and change one soul at a time. Now, here is your host to introduce today's guest and topic. Well, thank you, Matt. I am your host today, Peter Karutz, and I'm live in studio here in St. Louis, Missouri, the Rome of the West with Father Larry Huber. Father, good to have you here. Good to be here, Peter. Thank you. We are going to be talking about faith and discipleship. Now, first off, don't think that's easy and that's common and that's boring. It's going to be anything but (laughs) faith and discipleship. What we do every day in various aspects of our life requires great faith. Yes. Great faith in our brothers and sisters, in perfect strangers, people we don't even know. We have faith and confidence in people. But we're going to go beyond that. We're talking about faith in God and his providence as well. Amen. There we are. Let's start with a prayer. How's that? I was about to say. Let's do that. Thank you, Father. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the faith that you have. It's a, your gift of faith uh, that we have in Jesus, your Son, and in your great love. And we pray that people will continue to uh, abound all the more in, in faith in, in your church, the Church of Jesus Christ, the Catholic Church. And we pray for Christians everywhere that as they go through the ups and downs of life, that they will always uh, rely on you in navigating through these difficult moments in their lives and in our world. And let's remember our loving mothers, we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. St. Joseph. Pray for us. Name the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Saint, uh, isn't it today the feast day of Saint uh, Pius? The t- no, that was. Was that yesterday? I think I messed it up. There's all no, kinds of saints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All kinds of saints we can pray for, yeah. ask for uh, their prayers. Father, we are talking about faith and discipleship. So one goes with the other, right? Yeah. Um, what is faith? So we, we place our faith in a lot of things, and, and I'll just use the classic uh, St. Paul uh, in Hebrews 11, verse 1, faith is hope in what is not seen. And in life, we put our faith in so much stuff, you were, you were kind of touching base on it as I was driving up and heading towards this building. I, I was in my car, and I put my faith that those brakes are going to work, otherwise I'm going to have a close encounter with this building. But fortunately for me, the brakes work, so whoever installed those brakes, I pressed them, and they stopped the car before I hit the building. And I was able to get out of the car. Uh, This coming Sunday, tomorrow, I'll be jumping in a plane and think how many people uh, put their faith in a plane that we're going to get to ride to our our destination safely. It goes on and on. We place our faith in the drinking water every time we tap in. So faith is is uh, there's a lot of a lot of things we put our faith in, and the key for us is to put our total faith in in God as we navigate these waters. And then for the catechism teaches us that faith is, as far as our, our, our religion, our Catholic religion is, faith is, is man's response to God, that God reveals himself in so many ways. Uh, he reveals himself through, through science and through the nature of things, through our reason, and then, of course, through sacred tradition, sacred scripture, God reveals himself. And then we got to make a decision whether we're going to respond to that in faith. And I can share with you, uh, I was born and raised in a small town, St. Genevieve, and I grew up with faith. We went to church every Sunday. And then when I went to college, uh, I was in a secular college and lived a terrible lifestyle, and and I fell off with my faith. I didn't even believe in God. And it was just using my reason that got me to believe that there was a God, and and, um, and there's a a long process that I won't get too, too much in the weeds with that. 
And then eventually I thought, well, God has to, you would think God would reveal him, him or herself. You know, I was open to whatever God was at that time. <laughs> you were out there, I man. Was, I was out there, man. And and I, then I, I thought, well, I'll just go with Christianity since that's what I know best, and I'll start with that. I was going to look at all the world's religions. So I went into Christianity, and I dove into the Bible, and then I found, okay, I'm putting my faith in God. I made, I collected the data on Jesus and, and, the, and the Bible, through the Bible, and then what I remembered in my upbringing as a Catholic, and I collected all that data, I recollected it and, and processed it, and then I decided to put my faith in Jesus, that he is God Almighty. And then the next step was, well, you would think Jesus would have uh, had uh, a church. You know, I just didn't make sense. Maybe that was my Catholic upbringing, but there has to be one holy Catholic church. And so I went back to the Bible, collected the data, and and then I found the, the Catholic Church in the in the Bible. So then I went back to being Catholic again and going to church again. And then of course, then God called me to priesthood. Look at that. And then I had to you know figure out how to, if I want to do that too. So so faith starts with collecting the data, and God understands that. So He reveals Himself in so many ways to us, uh, even even um, pagan uh, philosophers like Aristotle. Plato, they can come up with all this. By looking at the world and using human resource uh, re- reasoning to come up with what we believe about God, that he's one, he's eternal, he's all-knowing, all-powerful. So God reveals himself through philosophy and, he re- and science, and, and the church, probably no other institution, puts more money into science than the Catholic Church, especially when you compare it over the, over the centuries. Over the millennia. Millennium. And so... God reveals himself through science and through our world. And then, of course, God reveals himself through sacred tradition, sacred scripture. And we get an opportunity then to collect all that data. And then we got to make a decision whether we're going to put our faith in God. Yeah. And, 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 and I just want to say this, Father, as you were saying this and you were talking about this period of time that I won't, maybe I shouldn't use the word falling away, but you, you seem to have fallen away. And there is a title that our Lord has. It's the Hound of Heaven. Mm-hmm. That doesn't sound very nice, but I think He was hounding you. And oh I, yeah. I think I think that's the one thing. Faith is wonderful, but remember, God is pouring grace on us all Absolutely. the time. He wants us desperately. He, you know, we think of the story of the prodigal son, and we talk. You know, we're concentrating on the boys because that's who I identify with. All right. But think of the father, right? Think of the father. The, when that boy finally collected all his data and figured out, I'm going to go and I'm going to ask my father to let me be one of his servants, and he's reviewing and practicing what he's going to say. But what happened? The father saw him a long way mm-hmm. off, and he ran to meet him. Yeah. He runs to meet So our Lord wants us, Absolutely. desperately wants us, yeah. but he's going to give us the freedom to find faith for us to choose him, mm-hmm. free there, will. And what you're outlining, there is a supernatural, I mean, a bigger supernatural reality to this data collecting process and this faith process. There's a bigger, I mean, there's a, there's a natural reality to this, right? But there's a bigger supernatural reality in our faith process. And I cannot imagine how many people have prayed for you and I. Yeah, over the the yeah. years, even when we're from the moment we we're babies, how many aunts and uncles and grandparents prayed for us over those years, yeah. and that supernatural reality has had a profound effect on helping us gain faith in Jesus. And faith is not idle. Faith is not passive. Faith is active. I, I, I don't mean to bring up a bad subject. You're going to get on a plane, but I was once in a plane that was coming in um, final approach, final landing in Minneapolis in a terrible, horrible rainstorm, and we kept flying around and flying around. And I was finishing a book. I only had a page or two left. It was called uh, Eye of the Needle. I remember it. And our our plane was struck by lightning. Mm -hmm. It blew out the left engine. The lights blew out in the plane. And we listed to one side, and we started going down. Wow. And I stopped reading my book. (laughs) It got very, very quiet on the plane. And I didn't plan this, but I stopped what I was doing and I said an act of contrition. And I had such a sense of peace. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if this is very good, but I went back and finished my book. Yeah, I only had a page or two. I remember going through my mind, I wonder if I'll finish this book before we hit the ground. But 
Faith is something we practice. I, I think John Paul, when he got shot, he grabbed his rosary and he was praying. Mm-hmm. I don't think he planned that. But faith is something that we work at and we practice and we get comfortable with relying on God's providence. Yeah, There's faith. It is. And, and for us Catholics, uh, the data that we collect is a person. Yes, 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 yes. In Jesus Christ. Yeah. It, it's not just a, a, a set of values and principles. It is a person, Jesus Christ. And John, um, Bishop Sheehan does a beautiful job in this video that I saw. He did those television programs, as you know, and this was a 1953 production of The Soul. And he, and he describes so eloquently how our, our, our intellect goes out to things and it brings it in through the five senses and then sends it down to the will. And then our will has to make a decision where we want to go and go out to it. And we were, we were talking about like a hot foot sunda. Yeah. Our brain comes in and takes that hot foot sunda and sends it down, the information, sends it down to our will. And then our will wants to go out there. Right. And we'll go down to the nearest DQ or whatever, Fritz's or whatever, and we'll, we, we, our will wants to go out to that which it, it, it wants. And in the same way, think about when you and your wife first met each other. You immediately collect the data on each other. And what you're doing is you're collecting data on a human person. It's a person, right? A person again. And then you collected that data, and then you and your wife made a decision whether you're going to put faith in each other and be with each other through good times and in bad and sickness and health till death do us part. And you just you got to collect the data, but there's only so much, and then you got to make your, your faith in this. And you, you had no idea, like now you're, you're married 26 years. 29 plus. Oh, 29, 29 yeah. years, yeah. yeah. And you had no idea. The marriage did not turn out the way you thought it would 29 years ago. No marriages does. And same thing when God called me to priesthood, this 26 years of priesthood, yeah. it, this didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to. Couldn't know. We couldn't know. So when, we, when I got ordained, I was putting my faith in God. When you got married, you were putting your faith in God and your wife. You had to put a faith in a third person. Mm-hmm. But we collect the data, and I, I collected the data like, okay, God wants me to become a priest, even though it's kind of not what I wanted, but God wants me to become a priest. And I had to make a decision whether I'm going to put my faith in that calling. And same thing with you guys, too. So it, it's, faith involves a commitment, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit later, but it's, it, you got to do a good job of be, collecting that data. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and especially when our faith involves Jesus, we got to continue to collect the data. So we can build our faith. Yeah, what you said, Father. You've said it a couple of times, and it's ringing. It's finally, the head is thick here. I'm finally coming to the realization. When we're talking about faith, we're getting to know a person. Mm-hmm. We're getting to know our Lord. We're getting to know the infant. We never get there. We just keep seeking it because That's right. why? Because we want to get to know and spend time with those people that we love. That's right. It's it's natural. It's a part of the human condition. And we want to get to know the lovely more. And just like you and your wife are constantly getting to know each other yeah. over these 29 years, and, and you're constantly collecting data, and that helps you build your faith more and more with your wife, and that's certainly the case with, with our faith in Jesus. We keep collecting, well, I don't, I don't know if I have enough faith. Well, okay, well, then do something about it. Get to know the person of Christ. How many times John Paul II has done that? told us that when he was around. Get to know the person of the Christ. And how do you do that? You study the Bible, you study sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and then you you go to the in front of Jesus. You got to go, we, fortunately as Catholics, we got this thing called the Eucharist, and you go in front of Jesus and you, you pray. And all that helps your faith process there. Yeah, uh, I, I'm just a s- small right-hand turn on this one. <laughs> yeah. I, I will uh, encourage our listeners, if you haven't and you don't have an hour that you set aside for adoration a week, please think about it. Uh, there's, for especially for a guy who talks too much like me, mm-hmm. there's nothing like being alone with our Lord. Let, let me ask you this. Let, I, I'm just ask everybody out there. Think about it. If I told you, I don't know what you're doing right now, but if I told you, I know where Jesus is, I know where the creator of the universe is, and he has allocated time for you to spend time with him one-on-one. What wouldn't you do to get there? 
What wouldn't you yeah. cancel? What wouldn't you do? And it is like that. It's that quiet time to listen and get to know him. And so the, the data collection to build up your faith, there, there's a very natural element to that, but there's also a supernatural element, and that's where the Eucharist comes in. It, there is that supernatural element. It is supernatural, right. Yeah, this is not supernatural, but we're here at SJEN TV. This is TV. I said TV. Go to SJEN TV sometime. We have a, a Roku station, and there's lots of videos uh, on there and almost any subject you can imagine. And this is St. Joseph Radio Presents coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri, I'm your host, Peter Karutz, and we are on the radio with Father Larry Huber, and we are talking about faith and discipleship. By the way, if you would like a copy of this program or any other, please call us at 636-447-6000, 636-447-6000. I'll talk a little bit about, after the break, about the Catholic Woman of the Year, but think about a woman who, a woman here in St. Louis or in the general area who might, um, you might want to nominate for that. We'll come back and talk about that later on. Yeah. And here's the other thing, too. Faith in God communicates based on our ability to know. So uh, Bishop Sheehan talks about how if a teacher's going to effectively teach to a child who's in second grade, you're going to do that differently than teaching to a child that's in eighth grade or in high school. And to think about how much you and your wife have changed over the 29 years. You communicate to each other. You were two, you're, you're different people when you were newly newly married as opposed to now. So you're going to communicate to each other differently. And that's why faith is a constant process, not because God changes. He does not change. But we change, and and he, he comes to us in the level that we need him to come to us at. And so faith is governed by the laws of any relationship that we have. So we are different people. When I was 25 and God called me to priesthood, he communicated to me differently than, I, than he is now that I'm 57. Mm-hmm. And he's, and he's going to communicate differently in 10 years from now, too. So and, do you have clarity and certainty now, Father? Oh, yeah. That's, that's the other thing, too, yeah. And I, I love the story about faith is, is not certainty because then it wouldn't be faith, right? Then it wouldn't be faith. Because then it wouldn't be what Paul. Then Paul be lying. It's not hope in things that are not seen. And again, that's that's Hebrews eleven one. Hope in things that are not seen. That then Paul would be lying. Yeah. So there's no certainty there. Yeah. And then how do we build up our faith again? Collecting the data. And I love this story about uh, Father John Cavanaugh was a Jesuit priest that that was in Saint Louis U for a long time, and he told a story about, and I'm going to butcher up the details, but here's the gist of it. He went, he met Father or Mother Teresa for the first time in the 70s, and, you know, they talked in, in, in Rome, and Mother Teresa said, Father, what would you like me to pray for, for you? And, and the young John Cavanaugh said, well, Mother, I want what you got. I want certainty. And Mother Teresa just lambasted him and, and belittled him, like, I don't have that. That's, I'm not praying for that. That's silly, you know. And basically what she's saying, you, you, you grow in faith. If you want me to pray for faith, then I'll do that for you. And by the way, that means that you've got to work at continually collecting the data to build up your faith and turning to the sacraments to build up the faith. That's what you got to do. And another beautiful thing about this, it highlights, too, whenever I've been to Protestant uh, funeral services, it's generally this type of attitude Right or wrong, but this is their thing. They'll, the, the minister will say, and we're here to celebrate that this person is now in heaven. This person who's died is now in heaven, and that's what we're here to celebrate. And I'm like, uh, okay, if you believe, I mean, if you really have that certainty, that's fine. But when you go to a Catholic mass, a funeral mass, it's like we got great hope, and our faith is our consolation as our loved one has left us. But are we certain? No, we got we got we got to start praying. And one one uh, young Catholic mother said, "Now, Father, if I die before you do, don't you dare assume I'm in heaven. You pray for me." And that's a that's again all about faith. Prayer builds up our faith. Yeah, no, and and you're right. You know, you talked about Hebrews, and look, think of Paul in in all of the writings of Paul. Uh, does he talk about certainty? You know, look, what does he say? He says you need to work out your salvation with uh, uh, fear and trembling, or is that what it is? Mm-hmm. You, yeah, right. yeah. you have to work out your faith with fear and trembling. What, what, what?
magic words. Why do you have to be fearful? And then what does he say? He says, how terrible would it be for me who has preached the gospel to have lost? Yeah. Right? And even even at the moment of his death, he's saying, you know, I, I, I am... Uh, I have run the good race. I have persevered to the end. I'm not a Greek scholar by any ch- exp- by any uh, uh, measure, and I just repeat what I have heard. But all those I know who are say that Paul never st- spoke of salvation as a certain t- certainty. Mm-hmm. He talked about it as an active, ongoing process. We are being yeah. saved, and and along with that, then so. What does he do to get people to to continue with that pro- acting process? He always uses this this word called hope. Right. I mean, you just saw it in in uh, Hebrews eleven one. I, it's like, wow, is he just interact? Is he interchanging hope and faith? It's, it's so he's encouraging people stay with the process because we got great hope of God's love, and and, and hope is so important. Now, the other thing when we're dealing with all this and the data collecting and, and the faith and everything else is this. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church in, in 37, it talks about paragraph 37 right from the beginning. Wow. It, it talks about how we got disordered, a disordered appetites is what the Catechism says. And we can say disordered will, okay? And God. So our brain could be feeding, our intellect could be feeding our will things, and then our will wants to go out to this overly, overly want something, and it, it to the point where it becomes disordered. So we we overly want liquor or drugs or sex or uh, food or whatever it is, and it, it becomes disordered because it it trumps. What we should be really longing, and that's God, and a relationship with God, and all the people He placed in our lives, and that then we go. That's called sin, and so we got to recognize that. And it's like God wants to; He allows this to happen because He He steps back and He says, "Okay, even though these are going to be more pressing to you, these other um, appetites, as a as a catechism teaches us, I'm going to step back here because I want you to freely choose me." And so we got to get through all these other appetites and say, you know what, we're going to one by one set these aside. And that's why we got this beautiful thing called asceticism, where we give up food or give up something during Lent. And, we, and on Fridays, we encourage it to sacrifice something. I know in the seminary, uh, the phone could be so overwhelming and the, the data of other things, whether it be different um, hobbies or politics or whatever. And it gets so overwhelming that I had to take YouTube off my phone, and I had to take off all these games, and I and I made an intellectual decision to do that because it was becoming disordered for me, and it was placing my relationship with God and all the people. And so, and how about married people too? You got to set aside some things. It's okay to play golf. It's okay to go hunting. But married man has got to make a decision to kind of put those at bay. Yeah, and and Father, I think it's a continuum too. You know, as you said, it could you could have these are goods that we're talking That's about. That's right. Yeah, you know, whether it whatever it is, sex or golf or mm-hmm. whatever it is, yeah. they are all goods. And if you if you have an, a disordered uh, uh, desire for them, then then be, that becomes a disordered thing. That's but let's you talked about Lent and other things too. Very often, uh, we in relationship, whatever relationship we happen to be in. We do give up goods for a greater good. That's right. right. You know, from the beginning, when we are contemplating marriage, mm-hmm. you give up money so that you can put it into this little shiny rock, mm-hmm. right? You know, in as you're growing up in in marriage, you give up many things in order for the for the benefit of your family and your your children and you, your their education to the children, and so we give up good things. And in Lent, we give up good things. For the people we love, I mean, you think about it. You know, you're sharing a meal with someone who is a good yeah. friend of ours. You say, "Oh man, this this steak is unbelievable. They've prepared it in a different way." Here, let me cut off a little piece. I want you to try. It. I'm going to give them mm-hmm. a little, little bit of that good. What if we said, "Man, I have this piece of fish and it's horrible." Here, you have it. Mm-hmm. Right? We give thing. We yeah. give up things that are good for other people mm-hmm. because we are in relationship. Yeah. 
It yeah. helps us grow. Why? Because we love those people. That's right. Yeah, because we love those That's people. That's right. And all this is connected. Again, what, what I love about this whole uh, data collecting and the faith process is it, 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 it's a, the supernatural and the natural coming together. It, it's just so cool. So, for example, um, I read this book called The, uh, the Boy Crisis, uh-huh. and they were, they were talking about how you can look at the boy's brain, and when the, the brain is overstimulated, his dopamine receptors shrink. Huh. Oh. They actually shrink. And so it takes a bigger high to, to get the dopamine in your brain or the serotonin in your brain. So then they got to go through uh, games and more, more games, whatever it is, that they get, and they get bored. You know how many times you hear children, I'm bored, you know, everything else. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I remember my brother and sister-in-law, they had a dickens of a time to, to get their kids to get ready for school because they had the TV on. Well, they, they took the TV off, and then all of a sudden— they, they're, they're more manageable. And what, what this book has taught us is that if you let that boy or that girl have some quiet time, and that's the one time they mentioned prayer in the book. It was just strictly a mm-hmm. secular mm-hmm. study. That's when your dopamine receptors can actually extend out back to normal. And then that boy or that little girl can actually get a dopamine high on listening to their parents. Mm, yeah. Where before... They couldn't get that dopamine high listening to their parents because they were shrink. So they were so uh, they were sh- shrink in such a way that they couldn't get that dopamine high. In the same way, we can get a dopamine high and a serotonin high just listening to God if we get rid of all that other stuff. So got to get quiet. Yeah, got to get quiet. So that the natural and the supernatural come together. Yeah, no, no doubt. Well, we're going to take our break here in just a moment or two. So please. Tell a friend, tell them to come and have a listen. We're talking about faith and discipleship. And these two things are very, very much connected, right? Faith motivates us to be disciples. Uh, something you said, Father, is that these that the faith allows us to love God. And without freedom and free will, you can't go and love somebody. God wants us to have freedom. He wants us to have faith. And the two will work together to be great and good disciples. So we'll be back in two minutes. Looking for a way to teach your children about our Catholic faith? Colby Academy has the solution, offering a curriculum that is loyal to the magisterium, classical, Ignatian, flexible, and affordable. Colby can help with all your homeschooling needs. We offer a wide range of services, including live online courses for those looking for assistance teaching their students, recorded self-paced courses for those who want teacher instruction while needing the flexibility to move at their own pace, and traditional homeschool courses for maximum flexibility in home education. Our support services include advising for parents, record keeping and transcript services, a grading service, standardized testing, and guidance and college counseling. For more information, check out their website at colby.org. That's K-O-L-B-E dot org. Or give them a call. Area code 707-255-6499. That's 707-255-6499. It's Colby Academy. St. Joseph Catholic Radio is proud to announce the launch of SJEN TV, the St. Joseph Evangelization Network. SJEN TV is a premier online Catholic broadcasting network providing quality Catholic programming 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. We have programming such as live studio interviews, St. Joe's Java speaker presentations, current Catholic issues, and the Pro Life series. We're featuring the many talented speakers out of Orange County, California, and this Archdiocese of St. Louis, Missouri including Professor John Gresham, Father James Mason, Karen Nokemper, Rick Hollerick, Bill Federer, and many more. To review the program list, go to sjen.tv or on Roku, sjen.tv. All this programming is free, and we are welcoming sponsorship of new programs. Find out more at sjen.tv. Well, we're back. This is Peter Karutz. I'm your host today. We are at St. Louis, Missouri, the Rome of the West. This is St. Joseph Radio Presents coming to you live, as I said, St. Louis, Missouri. We're with Father Larry Huber, and we are talking about faith and discipleship. Not this simple, mealy-mouthed faith. We're talking about an active faith. We're talking about faith that is doing something. It's, It's gathering, as Father said, data so we can be better educated, we can inform our conscience. And then 
discipleship. We're doing something with it. We're not just having this intellectual pursuit. We're actually taking these tools and doing something with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the next thing we want to talk about then is discipleship and what does that all mean? And discipleship comes from a Greek word that basically means collecting knowledge, following some, a person around and collecting knowledge. And so we see how in the great commissioning of Jesus in Matthew 28, and I'll just read it real quickly here. Now the 11 disciples, of course, uh, Judas uh, took his life. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. So there's Jesus being God, right? That's who you, wor you worship God. So Only God. When, the, when these yeah. apostles, uh, the, and it, actually Matthew's calling them disciples at this point in time. Mm -hmm. That's key. When the disciples saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted ah. at this point in time, okay? Some doubted. Now, it goes on with Matthew 28. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples out of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and here comes the disciple part about teaching them. See, disciples all about constantly learning. That's the main thing. And then we put in action, but we got to start with the data collecting. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the close of the ages. And again, remember that the, the Greek word means collecting that knowledge, collecting that data. And so again, Jesus is telling these apostles, teach these disciples Right, yeah, calling them disciples and calling them to make disciples. So, Father, isn't our Lord actually calling all of us to do this? This is our job, all of our job. Don't yeah. just point to the people with the pointy hats and the in the uh, uh, zacchettos mm -hmm. and the Roman. It's all of us. We are all called in the Great Commissioning. Yeah, the Great Discipleship, and we're all called to do our part to learn. And again, there's a natural way to learn, and then there's a supernatural way to learn. There's a natural way to collect the data, and then there's a supernatural way to collect the data. As uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola just says, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the Holy Spirit is communicating to us in volumes at any one moment. And we got to get those spiritual antennas up to then be receptive to that. And many times in our learning in our discipleship, again, in our data collecting, it is certainly about, okay, here's what's right and here's what's wrong, here's what I should be doing, here's what I shouldn't be doing, and here's who God is and everything else. It's certainly that. But also, let's not forget the data collecting and the discipleship and learning is about learning who we are. That we are we are children of God, and 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 then learning about who we are in our brokenness, and the more we know about our brokenness, and the more we can manage our brokenness, and so discipleship is is all about all of the above. Yeah, and part of faith, I think, is is uh, uh, to put it simply, going to the gym. You know, I, I, we we go to the gym not because it's easy, but because it's hard, because it's something we need to do to to get better in our health, right? Mm -hmm. And some of the things we do in faith and in discipleship is we're, we're kind of going to the gym. We, we, we say the rosary, or as I do, I say it very badly. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got to tell you, I, I had said the rosary this morning with uh, our men's group, and I realized that I, my mind was, was drifting, right? And, and maybe that's not good, but my, my, my uh, mouth was praising God and worshiping God, and at the same time, my mind was open to what he had to say. I, it wasn't my thoughts. It was his thoughts. Absolutely. And, and that's part of faith, too. you got to do those things. They're going to open yourself up. To, you, you talked about putting the antenna up. You can keep the antenna down if you yeah. want to. you got that free will. But you put the antenna up, and you're gathering this fire hose of grace that's coming in and this, is, and this knowledge. But you can say no. God accepts the word no. Yeah. And and why while, while your mind was wondering, maybe that was the Holy Spirit making yeah. your compelling your mind to wonder, yeah. and you're you're only going to know that is okay. I just my mind just wondered now. Now what 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 happened there? And yeah. you got to you got to ask the questions right yeah. to to get that knowledge there. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then discipleship. Then 
it, again, it, it, it's all about continuing this ongoing collection of a person, Jesus Christ, and getting to know this person. And, and then we're going to get to know him differently as we grow older and mature physically, uh, uh, psychologically, and spiritually. We're going to continue to grow in, in, in a different way and come to Jesus to know him in a different way as we grow older. So it's an ongoing process. And of course, Jesus is God Almighty, so to get to know that person, that divine person who became human, that's going to take all eternity to get to know that type of no doubt. person. So, yeah, no doubt. And then in this then, we, we're going to transition. Now that's discipleship, and now it really is all about fulfilling our small part in this covenant that God has established with us. As you look at the Old Testament, God establishes covenants. Now, you being a businessman, you know that a contract is an exchange of goods and services. Yep. But a covenant, as Dr. Scott Hahn is really good about, is an exchange of? Persons. Persons, yeah. yeah. It's an exchange of persons. And the most important, or I shouldn't say that, one of the most important covenants that we experience in this world is holy Matrimony, Matrimony. Yeah. where two people give to each other completely mm-hmm. in good times and in bad and sickness and health. And of course, that is a, an outward sacramental sign for us as far as the bridegroom, Jesus, giving to his completely to his bride, the, right. the church and everything else. We're not just whistling Dixie here either. Mm. I mean, the Lord really equated the love of man and woman in marriage to the love of Christ in the church. You know, I, I, I was at a mass for my um, in-laws, uh, I don't know, what are their anniversaries? And the uh, oldest sister was supposed to read from, a, I think it was Ephesians. And, Ephesians uh, 521. She wouldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> I, so I had to go up and do it. But part of the problem is we don't move on because in the end, at, toward the end, it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and yeah. gave his life for yeah. her. yeah. Uh, you know, if you go to the cathedral, you'll see a wedding canopy mm-hmm. over the altar. You know, th- this love is a, an ex- a true exchange of persons. How much? All of it. 100%. To the end, the last, you know, to, well, to, as Christ did to his last breath, to his yeah. last drop of blood. And guess what the second reading is this weekend? Tell me. Ephesians 5, 21. Is it really? Yes, it is. <laughs> you have to listen to it. Yes, yes. So it starts out, if we could digress yeah, a little bit. Sure. It starts out, uh, uh, men, uh, see, women be submissive. Well, it first starts out by husbands and wives be submissive to one another out of reverence to Christ. Right. But go back to the word submissive. Yeah. And, and go back to the original language. It's If we break it down, it's be subject to to the mission. The mission. You are both in a mission, right? What is the reason to get married? To get each other to heaven. That's the mission, Mission. to bring your family to heaven. You are subject to the mission, right? That's the the great commissioning. Yeah, it is. And I use uh, Christopher West's book way back when. Good news about sex sex and marriage. marriage, Yeah. Yeah, and he highlighted this. I'm like, and that really opened my eyes. So what I what I tell I asked the wives, well, what does it mean to be under the mission of your husband? And then, well, I don't know. What's the mission of my husband? <laughs> okay, husband, what's your mission? And then it says, love your wives as Christ loved his bride, the church, hand himself over to sanctify her, and to hand himself over, of course, we know is the cross, right? Right. And so now you know your mission, your husband, is to love you. And even willing to to hand his very life over for you that you might be beautiful, and and so husbands are called to to figure out every day, every moment of every day, how am I going to communicate that my wife is a beautiful flower of God? Right. And now, now, mar- married women, what does it mean then to be under the mission of your husband? His mission to, is to love you, and it's real simple. Your husband's not Jesus. That means he's not God, and he needs a lot of help. And he's not perfect. And he's not perfect. <laughs> so just help the poor guy out a little bit, pray for him, do whatever it is. That's kind of what what I took from it, what it means to be under the mission of your husband, whose mission is to love you. Just help the poor guy out, because he's, he's he needs it. And it takes a lot of faith, it right? Does. It, it does. It takes a lot of faith, because the husband is not marrying the perfect person, the wife is not marrying the perfect person, yeah. but you have faith in that perfect person. Faith again. To bring you together. There's the faith again. Another book, uh, Three for Marriage, uh, and it talks about how, you you know, it's the Holy Spirit and, and the two 
getting married. Three for marriage. So the Bible, I always say the Bible starts with marriage, and mm-hmm. then it ends with marriage with the uh, nuptial uh, relationship with Jesus and the and the bridegroom. She's allowed to wear the the, the garments and the all the stuff and the the uh, heavenly nuptial blessing, uh, the marriage out there, and then there's marriage, 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 marriage throughout the Bible. And Jesus was hard-nosed on two groups of people, I always say. He was hard-nosed on religious figures, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, his own apostles. Yeah. He was pretty hard-nosed with them. He, he's demanding. Oh, no doubt. The other group he was demanding was married people. Sure. And because he understood more than anybody, I mean, he's God Almighty, that, hey, this marriage is a covenant, and it's an outward sign of what collecting the data and putting your faith in another person and, and making yourself vulnerable to that other person, and to to give yourself complete, that's what a covenant is, exchange of persons, to give yourselves completely to another. That's Marriage is one of the great institutions because it really does highlight that. And then, of course, we, we celebrate the, the big covenant every time we go to Mass, where God completely gives himself over to us, and, and there's a... Edward Cherie, Dr. Edward Cherie talks about this, the Greek word, when Jesus says, do this in memory of me, it, it, the, the, the more accurate Greek word would be, make this happen in memory of me. Make this present in memory of me. So when we come to Mass, the sacrifice that the bridegroom Jesus does for his bride, the church, becomes present at the Mass. And so the Mass highlight, it's a new and everlasting, ever-eternal uh, covenant. We're not going to need another covenant now. This is it. In the Old Testament, we see one covenant after another. Well, this is it. Mm-hmm. And in the Mass, then, we see God completely as he did 2,000 years ago. It becomes present for us again uh, in a continuous way at Mass. Right. And and maybe we, you know, I remember talking to one of my uh Protestant partners, and he was making, he gave me a whole litany of criticisms he had of the Catholic Church, and he says, you Catholics re-sacrifice Jesus every, every day. And, and it, the truth could not be further. No. You know, remember, Jesus was a Jew, and he, people called him rabbi, and at the Last Supper, they celebrated the Passover. And in the Jewish tradition, you are rejoining those Jews, those Hebrews in Egypt at the Passover. You are making it present again. And in the Holy Mass, at, at that moment of consecration, we are folding time into itself, and we are becoming present at the one sacrifice yeah. of our Lord. It's, it is one, it, once yeah, and for all, for all. all time. Remember, look, we're the people who are bound in time. God's not even yeah. in time. You know, he made it. <laughs> he created space and time. He's not bound by it. He's, he's outside of it, and he enters into it. For us. That's right. And it's a one perpetual sacrifice. We, we read about it in Revelation, the heavenly liturgy, and the first 11 chapters are deal with the liturgy of the Word, and the second last deal with the liturgy of the Eucharist, and what is our earthly liturgy divided into two main, two main parts, liturgy of the Word and liturgy of the Eucharist. And it's a perpetual sacrifice. It's an ongoing, it's such an incredible, awesome sacrifice that it continues on every Catholic altar, and who but God can do that? Yeah. Only God can do that. And all this then uh, helps us to, to remember that we're called every moment of our lives to recommission ourselves. God can, doesn't need to do it, but we do. And again, let's go back, let's go to the, this coming Sunday, as we talked about Ephesians 5.21, and now in, in, uh, in Joshua, Joshua was a young man when he took over the 12 tribes of Israel and led them into battles, and, and they're, in, they're now settled in the land, and in the, the, uh, this weekend's uh, readings from Joshua, he's an old man now, mm. and he knows what the Israelites have been. They've been in a lot of trouble. Well... We would be too, by the way, too. So before we judge them harshly, and they they cling on to their other demigods or other idols, many of them from Egypt, and they've been in the desert for forty years, and now they're in this in the promised land. And Joshua was like, "Okay, guys, we got to make a decision here. We're in the promised land. Who but God gave us this? Now you got to make a decision. Are you all in or not? And as for me and my house." We're going to be all in on the Lord. 
And it's interesting, too, when you read Joshua, when he mentions the other gods, yeah. they mention the word, whatever the word, whatever the Hebrew word gods is, because he mentions gods. Mm-hmm. But when, when, the, when they mention the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they don't mention God, Yahweh. They use the word Lord. Mm-hmm. As for me and my house, we're going to follow well, my, the Lord. Right. And we all got to make that decision. And then Jesus then, he gives this long, beautiful John 6 chapter, that Bread of Life discourse, mm-hmm. and it went on mm-hmm. for, for five weeks, although we missed it last week because of the, uh, the Feast of the Assumption. Assumption. But he's, he's saying, okay, guys, uh, are you going to want to leave me too? Yeah. You know, my, my own disciples, many of my disciples, those who were learning, again, ongoing learning, and they followed me around to learn, they couldn't handle this, and they left. Yeah. Now this, are you going to do it? This is St. Joseph Radio Presents coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri. We are with Father Larry Huber, and we are talking about faith and discipleship. And I, I got to tell you, in terms of faith, I think that's one of the pinnacles of faith. Mm-hmm. You get Peter, who is dumb as a rock, who, and, and our Lord just doubled down on, 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 you know, you must eat my body, drink my blood. People are leaving, and he looks at at them, and he says, will you leave me too? And Peter didn't say, I understand the whole thing from a theological yeah. standpoint, and let me give you the five points and counterpoints. And, and he said, you have the words of eternal life. Where shall we go? That was the epitome of faith yeah. in a person. Yes. He had faith in the person. He knew who Jesus was. He had faith in that person, not in himself, but in the person. He turned over himself yeah. to our Lord. And why? Because Peter followed this, this God-made man around, and he collected the data. Yeah. And he saw the miracles, and he saw the resurrection, and he said, Lord, or, well, of course, this is J- John 6, but he saw enough miracles. Right. Uh, so, but he just said, okay, where else are we going to go? Yeah. I mean, you had the words of eternal life. And we have to, Jesus is, was staring at the apostles with this, this question, are you going to leave me too? Yeah. And he's staring at us. Yeah. And he's asking us, are you going to put your faith in me? Or are you going to, you're not. And it really needs to be an all in or nothing. There's no halfies here. Do you believe in Jesus or do you not? And don't let all these other disordered appetites, it will get in the way of that. It'll get in the way of you putting your faith in God and it'll get in the way of you putting your your time and your energy and your heart into what you should be doing, and that's learning God. Learning God through work. You can learn God through when you're doing your daily work, but learn God and learn the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit's communicating to you. Jesus is looking at us and saying, are you all in or not? Do you believe that I have the words of eternal life? And if you do, then you got to go and follow me around through the church through the Eucharist, and then let the Holy Spirit, I gave the Holy Spirit, it's in you at confirmation, it's implant, it's confirmed in you. You don't have to look outside for the Holy Spirit, it's in you. And the Holy Spirit's communicating to you. So you need to be a true disciple, and there's going to be doubt. There was there was doubt in Matthew 28, right? Mm-hmm. And they doubt it. No, doubted, well, yeah, no that's doubt. What, that's what Matthew said there, yeah, right? Absolutely. And so we got it. Then what do we do to overcome the doubt? We got to follow this guy, Jesus, around yeah. the, our spiritual desert. We got about five minutes left. So let me hit you with a couple. Okay. We're talking about faith. We're talking about discipleship. Why should we pray? That's how we get the. That's how we collect the data. Yeah. And that's how we grow in faith. Yeah. It, a lot of people out there just don't don't they don't have the faith. They're worried about. Uh, a disease right now. They're worried about where they're gonna. They're going to uh, get money in the bank to pay the bills. Good, good things to worry about, right? But put that in perspective of God and His greater kingdom, and prayer almost like it it, it makes you, helps you leave space and time for just a moment. Yeah, right. And realize that there's a greater reality. These realities of paying the bills of this disease or whatever disease there is and ailments, and those are real. Yeah. But when you put those in perspective of the greater reality, it just puts everything in perspective. You talked about earlier today, you talked about how, you know, the Protestant churches, they seem to be canonizing the deceased the right there in, the, in their, in their uh, church. Uh, but we pray for the dead. 
Yes. Why? Because God isn't bound by time. So the prayers that we make, the prayers that we offer to God, he's heard them. Mm -hmm. He's heard them before we uttered them. He knows our heart. So pray because it does make a difference. Do we change God's mind? No. But he's all, he loves us so much, he took us took them into consideration already. Yeah. yeah Amen. Yeah. 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 Gosh. And then we, uh, you know, we we pray for people who ha- have gone before us, Mark, sign of faith, and we're like a little bit questionable on whether they had enough faith. Like uh, months ago, I did this bear, and I'm like, oh, man, I don't know. If, uh, so then what, what does that compel me to do? I'm praying for him. Absolutely. And and I'm, I'm in communion with him. Yes. This guy that I, I never met. And I'm worried about him, and I'm in communion with him, and and it's it's I, I I think about him all the time, even though we we had his burial months ago. Yeah. And so I, I'm hoping that maybe as a son of God, a God, uh, a son that God loves, and I'm kind of special, even though I'm broken, severely broken, maybe my prayers will help help him. Who knows? How can we grow in faith, and how can we become better disciples? Amen. There, and that that means being all in and following this. This, this God-made man, Jesus Christ, through his church, and then listening to the Holy Spirit that, again, is implanted in us, praying, coming for Jesus. And it, it's always decision time for us. As, as, as we, until, while we're living in this world, it's, it's always, okay, are we going to put our faith in, in Jesus? And it's not a one-time thing. Obviously, the, the Israelites, when they, they, said, they said to Joshua, okay, we're all in. Yeah. Well, how the, how that work for Not them? Not so good. Not so good. They, no. they, they fell back to their old ways. And then J- Jesus constantly gives us the question, are you all in or not? Because as soon as you say yes, at least for that moment, I'm going to take you in. Yeah, yeah. And then knowing that you're probably going to fall again, then we got we got to answer the question again. Yeah. Are you all in? Are you go- do you believe in the words of eternal life? Yeah. And in, and in marriage, as you said, that's why we call it a covenant of marriage, because we are all in. We have to be all in, not just partially. If, if you're, and I, I got to tell you, I've had friends who've gotten divorced or been in troubled marriages, and I, I remember one guy, we were out in front of my office, actually, and he's, you know what he said? He said, I'm not happy. Mm-hmm. I said, you're not happy? Who asked you to be happy? I don't remember that part of the marriage vows. You know, the part of the all in is being 100% when you don't feel like it. You know, it's when you are loving the unlovely. That's when you do the most good. My, I was in a bad car accident when I was 19. And my buddy was in the back seat, broken leg. And the paramedics came in through the back window. Wow. And my buddy was in horrible, horrible pain. And he said, don't move me. Don't move that. It's, gonna, it's hurting too much. Don't move it. And the guy was trying to extract him for the car, from the car. And my buddy decked him, the wow. paramedic. One punch knocked him, oh knocked him off the car and on the floor. You know what he did? Huh. That paramedic, he got back up. And he went and he got him out of that car. Nice. He wasn't very happy about the punch, yeah. but that's what faith is. That's what love is. It is returning good to someone who is in need of that good. That's what faith is. Yeah. Faith is knowing what you need to do. Why? Because God is calling you to that. That was his calling, yeah. and he wasn't reacting to what he did. He was reacting to what he needed. Yeah, right. that's awesome. Well, let's say a, a prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings of faith, and and we let's say in our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son. Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Well, we have about five seconds left. Call us and uh, find us on the Internet and nominate a good woman for Catholic Woman of the Year. Don't forget, stjosephradio.net. We'll see you next time. You've 
are listening to St. Joseph Radio Presents from the Rome of the West, St. Louis, Missouri. If you would like to join us in our evangelization efforts, you can order a copy of today's broadcast or any of our past programs by visiting us on our website, stjosephradio.net. That's S-A-I-N-T, josephradio.net. Or call us, 636-447-6000. It's all at your fingertips to help us evangelize the world, bringing the good news of Christ to everyone you meet and change one soul at a time. Thank you for your prayers and support. Until next time, may God bless you and your family. This has been a presentation of St. Joseph Radio Presents.